Ray Sheline Sr. was a legendary science teacher here at Woodward High School in the middle of the 20th century. In the 1930s, he taught his science classes about the brand new theory of releasing the power of a split atom. Gordon Keller, who as a young boy grew up on these farms near Pace Center Park, today's soccer fields, had been reading about it too. The part-time University of Toledo student had an interest in atomic physics while working on his engineering degree. Just a few years younger than Keller were Ray Sheline Jr. and his Woodward classmate Aaron Novick. They too went off to college with a curiosity about this untold source of power. Sheline and Novick both graduated in the sciences and in 1942, the federal government approached them with jobs. Sheline began researching uranium at Columbia University in New York and Novick was sent to a little known desert outpost called Los Alamos in New Mexico. Gordon Keller applied for a mysterious job with a new company in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, the Clinton Engineering Works. Keller took a train down for an interview and came back giddy with excitement. He couldn't tell his wife anything about the work except that he wanted to be a part of it. A couple of weeks later, the young married couple packed what they owned and headed south. All these Toledans were secretly part of the Manhattan Project and unknown to the rest of the city was that the Manhattan Project was already here too. This old factory on Harlow and Post was the site of a secret uranium project right here in Toledo. Today we're going to talk about the plans that took the atomic bomb from these young men and women in Toledo and this factory to the end of the Second World War. The end of World War II is one of those stories where everybody knows how it ends. We know the war ends with atomic bombs dropped on two Japanese cities, which the men we just talked about from Woodward and from UT were a part of. What's important to understand is what got us to that point. So I'm going to back up and start this story with the Battle of Iwo Jima and the beginning of 1945. If you remember from earlier discussions, in 1944, the Americans had now fought not just the Japanese military on islands throughout the Pacific, but they had fought with Japanese civilians in the battles in the Mariana Islands, on Tinian, on Saipan, and on Guam. And the American military was, was learning a terrible, terrible truth, which was that it wasn't just the Japanese military that wouldn't give up. Japanese civilians wouldn't give up either. And they were very much becoming of the opinion that any planned invasion of Japan was going to be very deadly. And the events of 1945 were really going to reinforce that idea, whether it was completely accurate or not, within the minds of the decision makers. So fighting was pretty desperate in, in the Pacific. After the Battle of Guadalcanal, the Japanese army virtually never retreated. The battles on Saipan showed that ethnic Japanese civilians would fight to the last. And as the Allies inched closer to Japan, they encountered rising casualty rates. Every time you got closer, Japanese resistance stiffened to a just astounding degree. So Iwo Jima is one of the battles that's really synonymous with the Second World War, and especially with the Pacific War. Iwo was located right out here. Now, the United States, in, these, in those early battles of the Pacific that we talked about, we were working our way up from the Solomon Islands in New Guinea, and then the Battle of the Central Pacific came through the Marshall Islands towards the Marianas, and the battles on the Southwest Pacific came up from New Guinea towards the island of Peleliu right here, which also isolated the Mariana Islands, and then MacArthur's forces were coming up here to the Philippines, moving towards Japan. Iwo Jima was really strategic. If you look at this push, from the Marshalls through the Marianas. From an airbase in the Marianas, you could, on one of the brand new B-29 bombers, bomb Tokyo and come back. But you were going to be really low on fuel and you needed everything to go right. Iwo Jima is almost exactly halfway in between. And Iwo was seen as a place that, if the United States controls this island and its airstrips, we have an emergency airstrip for air crews that run out of fuel, run into bad luck, get, in, get damaged by enemy fire over Japan, there's at least some chance of saving those planes and those crews if you take this island of Iwo Jima. Um, now, we're going to look at some photographs, and I want you to identify some of the problems 
of fighting on an island like Iwo Jima. So if you look at this, think for a second about what you see here. Hopefully you're noticing that the end of this island is dominated by a giant volcano. Okay, now it's dormant. It's, it's not an active volcano at this time, um, but it's a giant volcano. And look at the sides of it. You don't see a lot of trees on the sides of it. It's open rock. When you look down at the beaches, there's not a lot of cover. Whoever controls the top of that rock has perfect lines of sight to kill invaders on a scale we haven't seen since Normandy. Here's another view at that from a different angle. This is looking up at it from the beaches. And I want you to notice something about that beach. Take a good look at it and look at that sand. This is a very fine, powdery, ashy sand. It's difficult to move in. It's difficult for men to walk in it, much less run, much less drive tanks that are going to get bogged down in it. This is a very difficult beach to take. In this photograph, again, you see that mountain, Mount Suribachi, that dominates the end of Iwo Jima. And you see the Americans at a cannon trying to take aim at Japanese positions dug deep into that rock. And this photograph to me is always pretty astounding if you can figure out what's going on here. You're looking at a guy on the edge of a mountain on his belly working his way up and then all the way down there on the beach you see that landing craft. Um, it, it shows you how steep it was, how desperate the fight up the side of the mountain is going to be. And here you see guys on that terrible sand again, trying to just inch their way to the top of it. It's, it's the kind of fight where you're not just fighting the enemy, you're fighting the island itself. The Marines called Iwo Jima a nightmare in hell. We knew Iwo Jima was going to be bad, but we didn't know how bad. For 70 days, fighting rages on this island. 24 hours of bombing, 24 hour a day bombing, precedes the invasion to drive the Imperial Japanese Army into their complex of tunnels and try to make the invasion itself uh, somewhat easier. The invasion begins on the 19th of February. Um, the Marines are going up these black sand, this powdery sand beach, there is jagged volcanic rock out there that slices open their boots. There's a quote here uh, from one of the best one-volume histories of World War II uh, called The Story of World War II by Dr. Donald Miller. Uh, and Dr. Miller says, We buried 50 at a time in bulldozed plots. We didn't even know if they were Jewish, Catholic, or whatever. So we set a general committal. We commit you into the earth and the mercy of Almighty God. I buried 1,800 boys in two days. The death rate on Iwo Jima for American Marines was intense, as intense as anything you had seen in this war. Iwo Jima, as the men move inland, becomes a symbol. Um, after four days, Marines made it to the top of that mountain, Mount Suribachi, and they raised two flags. And look into the story of it sometime. It's not something I have time to go into in what's supposed to be a 20-minute or so movie. Um, they raise two separate flags, and it becomes a famous photograph, as you see behind here. And that famous photograph uh, has become a famous statue just outside of Washington, D.C. for the United States Marine Corps Memorial. Um, it becomes a symbol of victory after four days, but there's another month of hell ahead on that island. Um, the American people, after they see that picture, kind of think the battle's over and it's been won, when in fact it's only beginning. 30% um, of the American forces committed to that island 7,800 people died in taking 10 square miles. And again, Iwo Jima isn't part of the Japanese home islands. This is way off the Japanese coast. And the Japanese military fought to the last man to hold on to something that wasn't even necessarily Japanese, historically, a Japanese home island territory. On the other side, we have the Philippines. And the Philippine campaign had been going since uh, the first island of the Philippines had been landed on in October of 44, and then further landings are happening in January of 45, just before Iwo Jima. America wanted to take the Philippine Islands for several reasons. Number one, they were quite strategic as you're moving towards Japan. There's always been an argument on whether or not it would have been better to take Taiwan instead of the Philippines. Um, 
that's an argument we can't have because this guy, General Doug MacArthur, was obsessed with getting back to the Philippines, which he had abandoned uh, back in 1942. Um, over the 10 months of the Philippine campaign, 62,000 Americans are killed. And that's equal to the entire death toll of 10 years of the Vietnam War. And all of you have probably grown up on the stories of your grandparents or great uncles who fought in Vietnam talking about how awful and terrible that war was. And it was. They're absolutely right. But that death toll in Vietnam over 10 years was reached in 10 months on the Philippines. Um, that war was even worse for Philippine civilians. The Philippines had been part of the U.S. since the Spanish-American War, which we talked about some time ago. Um, and the Philippine civilians, we, we often talk about how racist the Germans were in the Second World War. We do not talk about the racism of the Japanese. And the Japanese saw the Filipino people as something less than human. And they wanted to teach them a lesson for collaborating with the Americans. After the Philippines was the Battle of Okinawa uh, in April of 45, going into May. Um, in Okinawa, every awful thing about the Pacific War came together in one place. The kamikaze attacks, the civilian atrocities, fighting to the last person. 16,000 allies are lost in the invasion, but it took killing 250,000 people to take the island. And if you look at this from a numbers perspective, you would say, well, clearly the allies won because they lost less than 10% of the people that the Japanese lost. But when you start looking at this at a human cost, this is, this is something like we've not seen before in American history. We've never fought in a war like this. Whether we're talking about the Civil War, the First World War, the American Revolution, or even the European War that's just ending at this time, nobody in America has seen a fight like is happening on Okinawa. And Okinawa is the last island before you get to the Japanese home islands. And the thought process that everybody in Washington, D.C. is having is, if they fought this hard for Okinawa, how hard are they going to fight for Tokyo? So American planners are very nervous. If the Japanese fought this hard for a non-Japanese island, how hard are they going to fight at home? Um, this was seen as the ultimate expression of the Japanese Army's um, strategy. And I use the words here of an American, uh, uh, American officer at the time who said that the islanders were brainwashed into a submission and death cult. Um, those, are, those are not boil words. This was seen as a really bad sign going into the ultimate invasion of Japan. Here's that fleet. Uh, off Okinawa, just hundreds and hundreds of ships. So the planning begins for the ultimate invasion of Japan, which they were calling Operation Olympic. And there were guesses all over the place on how many Americans were going to die in this invasion and how many Japanese people were going to die in this invasion. And the numbers ran into the millions. And those are the kinds of things that are before the brand new president, Harry S. Truman, as he's being confronted with the idea that we have this brand new thing called an atomic bomb that we believe can change the course of the war. So he's thinking about a lot of these things, and the generals are thinking about a lot of these things as we're moving toward the end of the war. Now, that bomb. No one knew exactly what was going to happen when it was tested. There were some people who theorized that it would set off an atomic chain reaction. That when you split one atom, it would cause the atoms around it to split, causing the atoms around that to split, and the planet would be vaporized within minutes. Um, there were other people who thought it wouldn't work at all, that it was going to be a big fizzle. Um, the, the weapon gets tested in the summer of '45 at Alamogordo, New Mexico, in what were called the Trinity Tests. And the questions about the effectiveness of the bomb were answered, but the bigger question was not. Would this be enough to coerce the Japanese into surrender? So the, thus begins the process of choosing targets. Some of the generals favored dropping it immediately on Tokyo, saying, kill the head and the body will die. If we, if we kill all of the high command, the entire Japanese military will fold. But Tokyo was already mostly destroyed at that point by firebombing that had been going on since, 19, since the beginning of 1945. 
uh, we had had massive, massive bombing raids happening over the major Japanese cities. And the scientists, who are now kind of equal partners with the military, the scientists want to learn what the weapon will do on a clean target. So they set out some parameters for what kinds of cities are going to be targeted. Um, they want a mostly wood structure area, a place without a lot of brick structures. They want to see what it does to wood structures. They want at least one mile of dense population. They want high strategic value, meaning war industries, military targets, and they want it to be untouched by previous bombing. There are supporters and there are opponents for dropping the bomb. The people who wanted the bomb to be used um, were primarily from the military. Now, it's important to say that this was not a very big debate because there were very few people who knew that the bomb existed in the first place. But of those who did, <coughs> the military men were overwhelmingly in favor of using the bomb. And what I typically talk about in class with students is, imagine if you'd seen your friends killed. Imagine if you commanded a unit and 2,000 men in your command had been killed, you'd probably use whatever weapons you had at your disposal to. Um, in the immediate aftermath, right after the bomb was dropped, the American people were, were widely in support of the bomb. 90% of Americans said, yes, absolutely, using the bomb was the right thing to do. But there were voices against the bomb, too. And among those who said we shouldn't use it were the people who knew it better than anybody. Um, Einstein, Leo Zillard, uh, James Frank, all of these scientists opposed using it on a live target. Um, some of them said we should do a demonstration. So we'll go out to some barren island in the Pacific. We will, under a flag of truce, escort a Japanese military delegation out to that island. And we will let them watch what we watched at the Trinity test. We will show them this is what one of our new bombs can do. Are you ready to surrender now? And the scientists believed that would be enough to get the Japanese military to quit. They would see the awesome power of the weapon and say, we want no, no part of that whatsoever, um, and surrender. Um, Einstein himself said after um, that Roosevelt would have forbidden the atomic bombing of Hiroshima if he had been alive. It was probably carried out by Truman to end the Pacific War before the Soviet Union could participate. And as always, by reputation, Einstein is a pretty smart guy. At least part of this is true. Truman did want to end the Pacific War before the Soviet Union could participate. Back at the Alta Conference, the Soviet Union had promised to join the Pacific War around the middle of August, and the U.S. really wanted this war over before the Soviets got involved, because they were afraid then the Soviets would try to uh, claim territory in Japan, just as they had claimed territory in Eastern Europe. So, moreover, a lot of people in the United States realized the Soviets are probably not going to be our friends when this is over. People saw the Cold War coming to some degree, and they said de demonstrating the bomb's power on Japan would be a deterrent to Soviet expansion, that if they know we have this thing that they don't have, um, it will keep the Soviets from doing really uh, provocative stuff in the immediate post-war era. So the bomb that gets dropped on Hiroshima, um, why did Hiroshima get picked? Well, first of all, it was headquarters for the Second Army, for the Imperial Japanese Army, and it was a hub of communications and logistics. Um, it also met the uh, qualification of having dense population at its center, um, wooden structures, and on and on. And on the day that the plane Enola Gay takes off with the bomb aboard, it wasn't cloudy over Hiroshima. And one of the things that the scientists and the military really wanted was visual targeting, have eyes on the target, and they wanted pictures of what the damage did. So on the 7th of August, Enola Gay takes off from the island of Tinian, back in the Mariana Islands, and drops the bomb called Little Boy over the dead center of the city. This is the before and after from the bomb site pictures. And you notice how here you can identify streets and alleys and buildings, and here you can barely make out the outlines of streets that are now just, you know, covered in, in rubble and ruin. Tokyo, the seat of government for the Japanese nation, 
didn't know for hours exactly what had happened because phone and telegraph lines were down and they were getting some wild reports back of a massive firebomb, um, but they really didn't know exactly what had happened out there. 90% of the doctors in Hiroshima were dead immediately. Every hospital was destroyed. 70% of the city was flattened. Around 50,000 people died instantly and another 75,000 or so die later of radiation sickness and other um, illnesses related to the radioactivity and explosivity and heat of the atomic bomb. Nagasaki was the second city car targeted a few days later. It was the largest port in Japan. Uh, factories there built ships, ordnance, and military vehicles. And the bomb in Nagasaki was dropped in an industrial area. Um, but that industrial area was flanked by hills. And there was an echo effect of the explosion where the waves of energy from the explosion went out and then bounced back off the hills towards the center of the targeted area. Um, temperatures in Nagasaki near the center of the explosion reached 7,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The winds created by the explosive force reached 624 miles per hour. Um, in Nagasaki, about 50,000 people died instantly. Um, had those hills not been there and the explosion rolled out, the death toll would have been much higher. Surrender comes on the 12th of August when Emperor Hirohito realizes it's over. And the emperor kind of calls the military together and says, this, this is it, we're done. Um, and two days later, the emperor makes a live radio address to talk to his nation. And that was wholly unexpected. Um, Hirohito was revered as a god, and the Japanese people had never heard his voice before until he's telling them that our nation has surrendered. MacArthur, uh, the American general, is put in charge of negotiating and accepting the surrender, and he arrives in Tokyo hours after the surrender is announced um, in a situation that was really touch and go. Uh, this, this is a very recently defeated country. Are, are we going to be ambushed as soon as we hit the ground? MacArthur allows the emperor to remain as a figurehead. Um, the Japanese were allowed to keep the figure of the emperor, and Japan still has a figurehead emperor to this day. And then on September 2nd, uh, the formal surrender papers were signed aboard the battleship USS Missouri, uh, which you can tour today if you ever go to Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. This brings us to the end of our, our short discussion on the end of the Pacific War. And in our next video, we'll talk more about what did this all mean? You fought this entire war. What did it all mean in the end? And how did it lead to the foundations of a new world? Thanks for sticking with me, folks. Be well.